Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Kyle Plush? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the incident, and offer my analysis. Kyle Plush was born on September 30, 2001, and was raised in Cincinnati, Ohio. He lived with his parents, Ronald and Jill Plush, and his sister, Allie. Kyle suffered from a spinal cord injury at four months old and had emergency surgery. He had serious medical complications for the rest of his life. For example, he was not able to use his right hand. Kyle was described as friendly, gregarious, responsible, mature, and intelligent. He spent many hours playing with Lego bricks. He was a Boy Scout and wanted to be an Eagle Scout someday. In the spring of 2018, Kyle was a sophomore at the Seven Hills School on Red Bank Road in Cincinnati, Ohio. Now moving to the timeline of the incident. On April 10, 2018, 16-year-old Kyle Plush drove a 2004 Honda Odyssey minivan to the Seven Hills School. He parked the minivan at the north end of a thrift store parking lot about 350 feet away from the front of the store. This parking lot was also known as the sophomore parking lot. After attending school, Kyle returned to the minivan to retrieve his tennis equipment for a match being held that afternoon. At this point, a tragic and unusual event took place in the minivan. The 2004 Honda Odyssey is equipped with three rows of seats. The third row seat is a bench seat positioned all the way in the back of the vehicle above the rear axle. This seat is designed to fold and flip backward into a space in the floor just inside the rear hatch. This gives the user of the minivan more flexibility for storing cargo in the vehicle. Kyle sat on this third row bench seat with the backrest portion of the seat folded flat, so he was seated on the rear part of the backrest. Kyle did this so he could put his shoes on to play tennis. In this position, the bottom part of the seat should have been latched, even though the backrest could be flipped upward and locked in place for use as a seat. Unfortunately, the seat was not latched. A spare tire that was positioned between the second row seats may have prevented the third row seat from latching. At one point during his effort to put on his shoes, Kyle turned around and reached into the rear of the minivan for his shoe. He was reaching into the same area where the third row seat would be stored when it wasn't being used. As Kyle reached for the shoe, the entire third row seat flipped back and pinned him against the rear hatch of the minivan. He went headfirst into the storage area in the back. It's not clear if Kyle was pinned by just the backrest or the backrest and the seat together, but either way he was trapped upside down against the rear hatch. The seat was exerting 69 pounds of pressure on his chest. Kyle knew that he was in trouble. Unable to use his phone in his pocket, he used the Siri function to call 911 at 3.14 p.m. An operator named Stephanie answered the call. Kyle said, quote, help, I am stuck in the van. Help, 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 I am stuck in the van outside Seven Hills parking lot. Help, I need help, 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 can you hear me? I'm at the Seven Hills parking lot, I am trapped in my van, help, help. I can't hear you, I'm in desperate need of help. Help, 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 I can't hear you, help, I'm going to die soon, help, help. Unquote. Throughout the call, a banging sound can be heard, and Kyle screamed twice. Three minutes into the call, it disconnected. This was at 3.17 p.m. Stephanie called Kyle's phone back, but was sent to his voicemail. Based on Kyle's cell phone GPS coordinates, Stephanie identified Kyle's location as 5471 Red Bank Road. This location was only 12 parking spaces away from where Kyle's minivan was parked. At 3.22 p.m., Stephanie labeled the call unknown trouble 
and dispatched the police to the Seven Hills School parking lot, telling them that a female was heard stating that she was stuck inside her van. Stephanie incorrectly believed that Kyle was female. The call was classified as Code 2, which is a high-priority call. The officers knew, or should have known, that they were responding to a serious situation. Stephanie believed it was possible the call came from the thrift store and relayed this information to the police as well. Again, this thrift store was about 350 feet from the minivan. Two Cincinnati police officers arrived at 3.26 p.m., 12 minutes after Kyle called 911. The officers searched the south end of the thrift store parking lot and other parking lots on the opposite side of the street, but they never looked in the north end of the parking lot where Kyle's minivan was parked. The officers called Kyle's cell phone, but just like Stephanie, they received his voicemail. There was an off-duty police officer directing traffic on Red Bank Road. The two officers spoke to him, but he said that he hadn't seen anything. The two officers never exited their police vehicle. In addition, they were eating and playing music in their vehicle as they searched. At 3.34 p.m., Kyle called 911 for a second time. This time, an operator named Amber handled the call. Kyle said, quote, Help me. In a lot at Seven Hills School. Help me. I can't hear what you're saying. Just send quickly. Gold Odyssey van. I probably don't have much time left, so tell my mom that I love her if I die. This is not a joke. This is not a joke. I'm trapped inside my gold Honda Odyssey van in the sophomore parking lot of Seven Hills, Hillsdale. Send officers immediately. I'm almost dead. Unquote. Kyle asked the operator if she could hear him. His breathing was strained, and he kept saying, Hey Siri. He may have been trying to place another call using his phone. Even though Kyle had talked quite a bit, Amber activated the TTY function as if she had received a silent call. This is a system that allows hearing impaired callers to communicate with an operator. Amber should not have activated this function because Kyle was talking. The TTY function reduced the volume of Kyle's voice by about 75%. The call disconnected after just under three minutes at 3.37 p.m. Amber called Kyle's phone back, but the call went to voicemail. Amber was able to see the first call, which had been handled by Stephanie, but for some reason, she never informed the two officers about the second call or notified her superior. At the same time as the call disconnected, 3.37 p.m., the two officers departed the scene, declaring that they didn't find anything. Kyle wasn't going to receive any help at all, despite having called 911 twice and indicating that his life was in jeopardy. Not long after the police left, Kyle Plush died from mechanical asphyxiation. During that evening, his parents used an app to locate his cell phone and realized he was still at the school. Kyle's father traveled to the school and discovered Kyle's body at 8.56 p.m., but of course it was too late. The city conducted an investigation and concluded that the 911 operators and the police officers involved in this case had not engaged in any wrongdoing. No discipline was imposed. Kyle's parents filed a lawsuit in August 2019. In April 2021, the case was settled for $6 million. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts on a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one. How did Kyle end up in this lethal situation in the first place? I think this was a one in a billion tragedy. A combination of unlikely circumstances came together and led to a horrible outcome. Kyle had opened the driver's side sliding door of the minivan to gain entry instead of using the rear hatch to get his shoes. He was sitting on the third row seat that happened to be unlatched. Again, maybe the spare tire was interfering with that seat latching. When he reached back to get his shoe, the seat flipped back and trapped him. Kyle weighed about 117 pounds and had some physical limitations. Investigators believe that his arms may have been trapped at his sides, and he was not strong enough to free them and push himself up. He was wedged between the rear hatch and the third row bench seat in such a way that he just could not escape. Kyle was amazingly resourceful 
he managed to call 911 two times and accurately convey the seriousness of a situation. Unfortunately, the people that he reached were incompetent. This brings me to item number two. The emergency response system failed at three different levels. The operator, Stephanie, who handled the first call, the two police officers, and the operator, Amber, who handled the second call. Let's take a closer look at the ways they failed Kyle. Stephanie never mentioned to the police officers how Kyle said he was going to die or that he was screaming for help. She did not tell the officers that the caller's name was Kyle, and she labeled the call unknown trouble. Stephanie should have labeled the call request for rescue. It is very likely that if firefighters had been dispatched, they would have found Kyle right away based on their history of properly using the mapping functions in their vehicles. The two police officers who were sent to find Kyle did not use the mapping functions in their vehicles, and they did not access their cell phone mapping tools. If they had searched for the Red Bank Road address that Stephanie provided, they would have found Kyle. They never actually went to that address. The officers were eating and playing music as they were searching for Kyle, and they never left their vehicle. It was almost like they simply did not want to find the caller. They knew the caller was trapped in a van, yet it never occurred to them to turn the music off or to exit their vehicle. The officers knew or should have known that they were on a high priority call, yet they didn't search the entire parking lot. At one point, when they were driving on Red Bank Road, the minivan was clearly visible in the parking lot just 65 feet away. In addition, the officers turned off their body cameras before leaving the scene. This was a violation of policy. The 911 operator for the second call, Amber, did not notify the police officers on the scene despite knowing about the first call. Inexplicably, she activated the TTY system, which made no sense based on the fact that Kyle was talking. Furthermore, she never switched back to normal mode even after realizing that the caller was not hearing impaired. Amber never bothered to replay the call to hear the details that she missed from having the volume reduced. Item number three, the city concluded that there was no wrongdoing in this case. Many people disagree. Some people believe that the 911 operators and the police officers were negligent. Others believe they were reckless. In my opinion, all four people engaged in conduct that they knew or should have known would likely cause injury. Therefore, they were reckless. There was absolutely no reason Kyle Plush had to die that day. He did everything right in an effort to save his own life, and everyone failed him. Now moving to my final thoughts. Some people wonder if there was anything that Kyle could have done to prevent his death, or was he simply doomed from the beginning? As far as what Kyle had control over, was this tragedy preventable? The only thing that comes to mind as far as prevention would be avoiding a minivan seat that is not latched in place. But how could Kyle have been expected to recognize that danger? I doubt there was any 16-year-old on the planet at that time who would have hesitated to sit on an unlatched minivan seat. Teenagers are taught to avoid things like drugs and strangers, but unlatched minivan seats are not even on the list. As far as I know, there had never been another death like this in the history of minivans. I don't believe there has been one since Kyle's death either. As far as contacting 911, as I mentioned, Kyle did everything right. He made efficient and high-quality attempts to get assistance that should have been successful. Most emergency workers are competent professionals who would have gladly made every effort to save Kyle's life if they had been in a position to help him. Unfortunately, Kyle ended up with the worst combination of emergency workers imaginable. Everything conspired against Kyle on the day he died, both before and after he called for people to save his life. Those are my thoughts on the case of Kyle Plush. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.